Today, we are happy to be joined in the studio by Pamela Garfield Yeager. Pamela is a mental health professional licensed as a clinical social worker. Recently, she's been writing online courses for parents to navigate the mental health system. She was recently featured on the documentary, Disconnected, the real story behind the transgender explosion. So, Pamela, welcome to the studio. Hello, thank you for having me. Glad to have you today. So, Let's just kind of get everybody comfortable here as we start out, and particularly for our audience, uh, tell them a little more about yourself and how, where, you know, where you're from and those kind of things, but also how you ended up choosing the mental health profession and how some of your experience there. Wow. So I've been a mental health professional for over 20 years. I actually got my master's degree back in the late 90s um, from New York University. And I got into it because I guess any naive young woman does because they want to help people. <laughs> I saw when I graduated college, I saw all the positions and all the things that I wanted to do required the master's in social work, which I have. And I really wanted to get involved. So that's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. And um, since then, I've learned a lot and I've grown and I, I've had, I have a vast amount of experience. Um, some of it has really opened my eyes to some challenges. Some of it has given me a lot of hope and optimism. It's a mixed bag. Sure. Um, but yeah, I have a, a vast experience and it's landed me here today. So tell us a little more about yourself, your personal life. Where are you from? And just generally speaking, you don't have to give your address or anything. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I live in California. I live in the Bay Area yes. near San Francisco. I live in a beautiful area. Um, but it's been a little challenging, uh, I'd say, politically, ideolo ideologically, but I love where I live. Um, I've lived here since 2003. I moved here from New York City. Mm. I actually lived in New York City during 9-11, and that was a challenge. I was a social worker then, mm. and I think that was the catalyst that actually brought me across the country to California, mm. to this beautiful state. So that's where I am today. Um, so, yeah, about what, where I'm at, like my profession, the reason I've written this whole um, curriculum is because I basically in 2020, my eyes were opened about many of the challenges and changes that have happened in my profession mm -hmm. and not for the better. And I've noticed there's been a lot at that time, when, especially when I started writing this, there was a lot of push about how kids are being indoctrinated in the education system. There was a lot of awareness and a lot of talk about that from lots of different major corporations and major organizations. But there wasn't a lot of awareness about how the mental health professional was doing the same thing. And that's something I was noticing myself as I actually was out on a disability, came back, so everything had shifted. I came back, saw just how shocking things were. Mm -hmm. and. That's what made motivated me to write this and to help educate parents on how to find a good therapist, how to find a good therapy, how to find the, the right kind of mental health treatment, because we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of especially conservatives say, I don't need it or I don't belong there. But unfortunately, especially after all the lockdowns and all the challenges we've all faced, especially young people, we need mental health care. So my mission was to help people find the appropriate mental health care and not health care that's going to end up indoctrinating their children or just be really unskilled or unhelpful. Well, since you opened that box, um, the question we have for you is people are hearing conflicting messages from, may I use the expression, mainstream therapists today versus maybe an individual like yourself. Um, so... Dig into that just a little bit more. And how do they know who to trust? Yeah, the, there's lots of things I actually write about. But one of the main things is parents should be involved in the mental health treatment. And if the parent is shut out, that's right there, a major red flag. Mm -hmm. A parent should be able to talk to the therapist and find out, at least generally speaking, what's happening and what are the treatment goals. 
And usually in therapy, especially when the parent is willing, they should be involved directly in the therapy, whether it be just talking to the therapist to give their side of the story or let, give them their observations of their child and their concerns, or maybe even be brought into family therapy. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, nowadays, what's happening more and more is therapists are cutting the parents out because they think they know better or they think the parents a bigot or something. And that's obviously a recipe for disaster. So that's, I think, the biggest thing. That's the main thing. Okay. Obviously, the hot topic is on gender ideology. And that's, I've starred in that film talking about that. Um, therapists are being taught to affirm, immediately affirm a child's gender without any exploration. And I obviously believe the different approach is the best, which is exploring what's going on and looking at the person as a whole looking at all of the issues that are happening before we affirm and affirming is not, not the best thing. So let me ask you this, because I mean, from periodicals and different, you know, uh, pediatrics associations, and I know that's a whole different field, but for a long time, all the established uh, scientific communities uh, were, you know, very much around, you need therapy, you need mental health, you need, you know, there are issues going on that need to be worked through with you. Uh, but the, the focus was around bringing corrective thinking, but here in the last couple of years, particularly, maybe a little longer, uh, we have seen almost just like somebody just flipped the switch and everything has just shifted all the mainstream thought and writing and so forth um, has just suddenly inverted. Can you give us some insight into that? I mean, what's behind that? Uh, and, and what are you seeing there? Well, I, I have some theories. I can't really say for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I'll just tell a little bit more about my personal story. So I was like I said, a mental health professional for over 20 years. And then in 2016, I actually came down with a terrible disability. And then I was cut out of my profession at the end of 2016. So I was kind of out. I called myself Rip Van Therapist because I was sort of asleep and not there while like what you just described, this radical change and shift happened. Mm. Then I came back in 2021, back to my profession, only part-time. I still actually have some chronic pain, so I can't work a full-time job, which is why I think it makes it easier for me to be more vocal on these issues. And I came back and it was so shocking, so different. So I wasn't there as things were shifting so radically. I just came back and everything was like black, completely different. Um, but I, I don't know how it happened. I, I've now learned a few things. I saw in the Candace Owens documentary that it turns out that the money from BLM, a lot of that went to trans organizations. So there's a lot of money behind this. Um, I know that Big Pharma has a lot to benefit from this to get children young on puberty blockers and on hormones because that makes them lifelong patients. Um, my profession, the social work, is completely captured by politicians. Rachel Levine, who we know is really a man. He was the keynote speaker at our convention this past spring to tell all of the workers that we need to affirm in order to save the lives of all the youth and people in our country, which is a lie. So there's there's so many forces happening. I think this has a lot to do with money and power, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of naive people who think this is helping and this is a nice thing to do. I think there's a lot of fearful people that are afraid if they don't do it that that they're gonna some their client will kill themselves. There's a lot of fear that's induced into people. And I think there's a lot of fear also of cancel culture. So I think a lot of people have been silenced. I get a lot of private messages telling me people telling me that they completely agree with me, but they can't speak up because they'll lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. So is I think it's a mixture of a whole bunch of things that have happened and it's happened really quickly. I probably the, I think it's combined with the, the lockdowns and I think how people relate to each other. We're more separated, we're more divided. People aren't talking, people are more shut down. 
And I think that's just made everything more accelerated and made people believe one side or another. Yeah. So, you know, we've been talking here around, you know, the transgender type focus and, you know, mental health treatment uh, for that uh, trends, uh, which we haven't really gone into that, but really the trend has been a radical shift uh, from more traditional uh, we need to find out what's going on uh, and help you work through whatever issues are going on in your life so that you can accept who you are and embrace and love who you are uh, versus uh, just simply, uh, okay, you, you're having a change of mind. Uh, you're confused about this issue. So just follow your thoughts and embrace yourself and we will embrace you too. Is that kind of, am, am I saying that in an accurate way? Is that kind of the shift that we have, that we're seeing in the professional community? Yeah. I mean, pretty much uh, what's, what's being lost is a therapist always in the past, almost to a, defa a fault, in my opinion, always analyze things, right? We as therapists analyze things. There was always that joke, you know, with Freud, a cigar is just a cigar because we, we analyze everything so much. Mm -hmm. And now it's shifted. It's flipped completely on the other end where we're not analyzing anything. M almost everybody who falls into the trans trap, for example, usually has some other underlying issue, whether it be they have another mental health issue, they have trauma, perhaps they're on the autistic spectrum, or they don't feel comfortable with the fact that they're gay and they don't like who they are. Um, usually there's some other thing, a family issue. And those things are now not being explored and they're not, people are not looked at as like an entire being They're The gen, once the gender thing comes up, that just becomes the hyper focus and it becomes sort of like a quick fix. It's not quick, but it feels like it. And it does usually feel better for the individual in the short term. Mm -hmm. So that's usually where they go until years later, usually it takes several years where they kind of wake up and realize this didn't fix the, the bad feelings I feel inside of me, the, the real deep issues that, which are, like you said, the self-loathing or the, the pain for whatever reason that they had is, was being covered up by the superficial stuff, which is either changing their appearance or changing their peer group or changing, you know, getting these superficial accolades from the trans community and getting a new flag, all those you know, actual status, maybe even getting money from San Francisco. I mean, <laughs> there's so many incentives. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, here we work in the space of education. Okay. Um, and we hear stories all the time. Uh, you know, we're based in Virginia. Um, the Fairfax school board, which is the largest in, in the Commonwealth here, um, I mean, they spent months trying to figure out a pronoun policy uh, for the system uh, while, you know, the bigger issues of why they exist is to educate our children and help, especially post-COVID re learning recovery and, and all these other things. Uh, it's like this obsession has kind of taken over uh, the space. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, if you're not focused on these things, there's something wrong with you. Um, at the same time, you know, we hear direct testimony from uh, students. Here's an example. So uh, a young lady uh, had a dysfunctional family. So her grandmother took her in from the time she was young, was raising her uh, when she came into middle school age. Uh, according to her own testimony, everybody in the school, especially the girls, were, you know, there was a lot of peer pressure. Are you lesbian or gay or are you transgender? What are you? It's kind of like nobody asked question, are you a girl? Uh, but it was all, you know, this new ideology thing and kind of pushing people to make a decision who they were. Well, she was so uncomfortable with that after a while, she just decided, okay, I'm going to be a transgender because she wasn't too confident about things going on in her life right then as a young lady, as a girl. And so she said, okay, I'm going to be transgender. And so 
They helped her pick out a, a man's name and celebrated her at school, and but nobody communicated that to home. And so as process of time, you know, the grandmother kept referring to her by her given name and so forth. After a while, you know, suddenly one day enforcement came and physically took the child out of the home. The accusation is that she was not affirming her transgender status. And so that was child abuse. Well, because she had, this girl had decided that she was going to be transgender when they went, took her into custody to take her away from the parent. Where do you think she was put? She was put with the young males. And that led to sexual abuse and on and on. And it's a very dark and a very sad story. Um, and, but yet those are the kind of things, these unintended consequences that a lot of times just the peer pressure groups and stuff, uh, they're not thinking what the long term thing is. It's about the peer pressure right now. So as as a counselor, as somebody, you know, to people who are experiencing this kind of thing, it may be in their family or in their schools or, you know, whatever. What would you have to say and what advice would you give? Oh, my gosh. It's really tough because it really is everywhere. So at this point, either if you, I mean, there's there's several options and there isn't a one size fits all advice for people because it really does depend. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of parents or people who are um, talking about this like I am would say immediately take your child out of the school, mm -hmm. which I think in a lot of cases is the right um would be the right choice. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes the child does have is thriving at school in other ways, right? They have they have a social group. It it depends. It depends on how they're doing in school and what their social group is and whether they're in a sport or you'd have to weigh the pros and cons. Right. So if if the child is been pulled into it and is already I'd say already getting into the dangers of it, then that might I think that might be a more viable option. Um, the other main thing to look out for, and I think parents are more aware of this now, is just how dangerous and influential social media is. And that's where a lot of these kids are getting this from. They're getting it from each other, but they're also getting it from social media, um, especially those who are more isolated. They're at home sitting on their phones or their computers, watching YouTube videos or looking at influencers or looking at um, memes that tell them that they're more valid as a trans person, or they're actually looking at other trans people who look really happy and are doing really well and seem actually pretty cool and fun and charismatic. So they're going to, they're going to gravitate towards that. Mm -hmm. So monitoring social media is also another thing that I think all parents have to do in this day and age, which is not an easy task. And unfortunately, even a parent who's really aware of that is still going to have challenges to keep the child off of social media because their their friends will give them an iPad or they'll they'll sneak it somehow. So again, challenges. Mm -hmm. I wish there was like an easy fix. Um, I think I think if the kid has not been involved, indoctrinated yet, or sucked in, I think it's it is useful to talk to the child about your point of view that. We want you to accept your body for what it is. And um, these pronouns and all, all this stuff is actually really harmful. It's harmful to them. It's harmful to their relationships. It's harmful to society. It's, it's making people fight. <laughs> it's making people not be themselves, even though it, the, the tagline is to be your authentic self. It's, it's doing the exact opposite. So helping kids have some critical thinking on that to recognize that, to not play the pronoun game, perhaps, mm -hmm. if they're strong enough to resist it. Um, a lot of it also is just about what's going on with the kid to be present with your child. So I think a lot of children that do fall into this, this is not blaming, but a lot of children that do fall into this for whatever reason, usually feel alone. Yeah. Sometimes it's because the parents are working a lot and they're, they're, they're working really hard. So they're not as present, or maybe they're just have a personality or a temperament that they struggle socially. Or maybe there are some conflicts in the family or, I mean, every, every individual is different, but usually there's 
some other issues happening at home, or maybe there's there's some grief in the family. Like there's 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 this situations where, like for example, a girl will take on a boy's identity because her brother died, and she feels like now that they need to have a son in the home, mm-hmm. or or maybe a parent died. There, there's all different kinds of cases out there. Right. There's no one size fits all. So it's really about being present with your child and and understanding what might be the underlying issues and also just helping them understand that there's something nefarious going on and to not go along with it. I think that's a very, very important point. Um, You know, parents, uh, whether you're, you know, traditional family, blended family, single parent, the reality is that our children need us um, and the way we make ourselves available to them will determine how much they need us. Uh, obviously, as they grow, we want them to wean away from dependency. But at the same time, as their parents, we are the first role models for them. We're the ones that help them, you know, learn all those basic things in the very beginning of life and and really uh, should be helping and mentoring and guiding them uh, at, throughout their whole development. Um, and really a matter of trust. And, you know, uh, families where the parents have built this strong bond with their kids and, and, and it's built around truth and trust, um, you know, typically, and I, I'm from my observation, and we can see what you said, because I know that there are always exceptions to every rule. Uh, but a lot of times having that strong bond of trust um, will make that child comfortable to communicate these feelings, these things that they're going through um, so that you know, the parent can engage with them. And when that's lacking, that that's when they go somewhere else and they tend to embrace other ideas uh, rather than those perhaps that their parents have for them. You want to speak to that a bit? Yeah, I mean, that, that does sometimes happen. Kids, they need the adults in their lives to be present. Um, but I also don't want to play the blame game because there are plenty of loving present parents and families where this unfortunately still creeps into their home. True. Um, I think usually it, it it's because the parents were naive and didn't recognize what's going on. I think a lot more families are becoming aware of this because it's being more talked about. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's what the, all of this is doing is preying on the vulnerable. So I guess the best thing to do is to help your family and your child be as less vulnerable. I mean, they're a child, so they're always going to be vulnerable, Mm -hmm. but to be that, that's, I, that's who they prey on is the kids that are having, I mean, a lot of it's just normal, usually adolescent issues with their parents. I mean, what adolescent doesn't have some kind of conflict with their parents or feel like their parents aren't doing them right at some point or another. And that's how the trans thing gets hooked in like, oh, well, we will do it better. We love you more or something Mm -hmm. like that. And the kids, the kid is young and naive and doesn't realize that. So yeah, giving those messages that I might not be a perfect parent because no one's a perfect parent, but I love you more than any person on the internet or even your teacher or a therapist can love you. Mm -hmm. So making sure that the kids know that even, and even the, there are parents who are unfortunately already struggling with their child kind of in this and they don't know what to do or say, that's been the underlying message to always let them know that that you love them because the kid is going to eventually recognize that their trans friends and their trans community and their glitter family is not their real family and their real family are the ones that love them and they, they're going to eventually come around to them and they need to know that you're there. 